attacked him and saved his life. And she said, God, please save my son. And God did. A good mother knows the good she's able to do for her child, even in a situation like this, is not dependent on her alone. That's a good mother. Because she realizes in some form or fashion that she is part of a bigger story, which all mothers need to be aware that they can be a part of. Now, in Exodus chapter 2 and verses 1 through 10, we see a story of a mother who would exemplify the idea that mother knows best for her child. But in fact, there's more to this story than meets the eye. Because this mother is part of a greater story. Now, this is a great story. I mean... If nothing else, you can read this story and you can say, this is a great story. Over 350 years before, though, this story is occurring, the people of Israel were respected in Egypt and honored because of the work of their ancestor, Joseph. Joseph had been delivered from jail and had made it to the pinnacle of Leadership in Egypt. But there was now a problem. There was a new pharaoh on the throne, and he didn't remember Joseph. And as a matter of fact, he didn't remember uh, any of these people. Who are they but a bother and a nuisance? I remember when I was working at a, uh, a job as a, I was the uh, director of compliance. That's a big title for saying you check to make sure everybody did everything right. <laughs> it's a big title. I was the director of compliance there for uh, this uh, particular company for about a year and a half, nearly two years, and everybody kind of liked me. And, and uh, then uh, I left the job to, um, to go away, to go back to school, to work on my, my Master of Divinity and was working part-time somewhere else. And they had me... Uh, come back, and I worked there part-time for a while, and everybody loved me, and, uh, you know, we, they enjoyed me. And then one day, uh, after I had left the company totally, I used to continue to go back to visit, because everybody knew me. And one day, I, I turned up at the job. I was going to visit people. I got to the front door, and they wouldn't let me in. I said, do you know who I am? <laughs> I didn't really actually say it that way, but the inference was, you know, when I showed up out of the blue, uh, you know, at a corporate headquarters, uh, you see, I thought that the people who were there were the same people who had been there when I worked there and who had been there as I had been visiting over the past uh, months and, and, and weeks. And I didn't know that they had left. <laughs> there had been a, a total, what you call a corporate restructuring. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I turned up out of nowhere, they said, we don't know you. And they wouldn't let me in. I called everybody's extensions and tried to get people to, to hear my, and receive my call, but there was no one there who knew me. It was the same with the people of Israel, the people, the Jewish people. As the Hebrew popu as the Hebrew, uh, this new pharaoh had come into power, uh, this new pharaoh, they did not remember Joseph or anything that he had done. And as the Hebrew population began to grow rapidly, it caused the Egyptians to be fearful. What if these Hebrews uh, continued to grow and turned against them? So they decided, we're going to take measures right now. It's fear. Fear. So they brutally oppressed the Hebrews as uh, slave labor. They began to beat them down. Literally, that's what the word means, to oppress. It means to beat down. But the more they beat them down, the more they oppressed them, the more they persecuted them, the more they grew. 
They began to breed like rabbits. So Pharaoh got to the point, the new Pharaoh in town, he got to this point where he decreed that all the male children of Israel were to be drowned as soon as they were born. It was a massacre. And hundreds of, and maybe even thousands of Jewish boys were murdered in probably the first ethnic cleansing in the Bible. You didn't let anyone know in Egypt, in this atmosphere, that you had a male child, as you knew that that child was going to be killed. But it's interesting now, as you begin the, this story in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1, and it says, now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a, Le- uh, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levi woman, and she became pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. And if you look at this story, it's interesting that you notice that this mother's name is not mentioned in this text. It's mentioned later, but it's not mentioned in this text. And so it seems like she's just an ordinary Hebrew slave who gives birth to a child. The fact that this mother's name is not mentioned tells us that there must be something more important to be seen in this story than the names of the individual, particularly the name of the mother. Actually, in this story, no name is mentioned until verse 10. And that's only after the child is born, and then the child is named. But in this story, no names are mentioned. You see, it's a very interesting thing When you have a child, a mother always does this. She focuses on the attributes of her child because a good mother sees the beauty in her child and immediately knows she has to protect that. Isn't it interesting? People always say about their child, you know, my daughter, my son is so cute. And then somebody else comes along, they didn't even notice your son or your child. You, and you're offended. Why? Because, why? Because you see the beauty in them that nobody else sees. That's a mother. <laughs> your child is always going to be the best looking mo- child, the, the most bright child, and the most intelligent child, the most good looking child. <laughs> you know, you know. I always love it when we. We brag about our kids, and we say, you know, my child spoke when it was one month old. (laughs) And then somebody else said, well, my child spoke when it was one week old. (laughs) And and then you start bragging, because what you see the goodness, and you see the beauty in your child. So she saw the beauty in her child, and immediately she knew that she had to protect that. And immediately she acted to protect that. She hid him for three months. Three months. How she did it doesn't really matter as much as the fact that she hid her child. And you understand very quickly that real mothers don't give up when their initial plans to protect the good in their children fail. They don't give up. This woman was desperate. And it says that when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, you see, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed, uh, uh, then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Don't highlight that. Those yet. It's interesting, though. She hid him for three months. And then she couldn't hide him anymore. And, and so she says, I'm going to go now to my another plan. And I don't really know what, if this is going to work. And you understand her very quickly. She doesn't really know if this is going to work. So she took her boy and she put him in a wicker basket. And by the way, it was the same word used here for this basket is the same word that is used in Noah's Ark. 
It was a little ark. And she sealed it with tar. It was a reed basket. And she sealed it with tar, and she put a lid on it, and she sent him down the Nile River. Now, the Nile River is a dangerous river. And she took the precautions that she could take by having his sister watch him float down the river to where he was coincidentally picked up by Pharaoh's daughter, who took pity on him, it said. She took pity on him despite her father's mandate to kill all baby boys. That's an interesting thing. When your daughter goes against the very mandate that Pharaoh said that everyone else must follow. He was coincident. She was, this boy was coincidentally picked up by Pharaoh's daughter, despite his mandate. And then her, her, her mother's, uh, his, his mother's heart must have been breaking as she watched this basket floating down the Nile River, not really sure what was going to happen. I can only imagine my heart would be in my hands. I can't even imagine how a mother would feel. Well, his mother's heart must have been broken when she saw this basket float out of sight. And when she thought of another woman raising her baby boy, drying his tears when he fell, and tucking him into bed at night, she must have had this tug in her heart, this pain in her heart. Uh, take those off. <laughs> Thanks. I'll tell you when to put them on. Uh, take them all off. I'll tell you when to put them on. I'll tell you when to put them on. <laughs> but she had to protect him from Pharaoh. She had to protect her, her son from Pharaoh as best she could. She had to protect him from Pharaoh. And if saving his life meant that her son would never know her or love her, she was okay with that. Then so be it. She would protect him regardless of the cost to her. Yet this mother's name is not mentioned. See, good mothers do what they have to do to position their children with the best chance to succeed. That's what good mothers do. That's what they do. You know, when I think about all that's going on right now, and I think about my wife's and the story, but I've read and, and seen documentaries about stories about Honduran women who, who have traveled hundreds of miles by foot across Central America to, to Mexico to cross the American border so that their child could be born in America and have an American birth certificate for the future. They may be not good. They may be sent back, but at least their child is born here. That used to be what people used to do because that was the, the best that they could do for their kids. Good mothers do things like this. But I want to go back to this story. You read the story and you'll see, but when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her, attention was, uh, uh, her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it, saw the baby, he was crying, and she felt sorry for her. Then, well, this is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter. This baby boy's sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? And she said, yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Coincidentally, this unnamed mother her son's, her son's sister 
was able to speak with Pharaoh's daughter and suggested to Pharaoh's daughter that she would be a good person to raise the child until he was weaned and got paid for it. And coincidentally, by the way, Pharaoh's daughter didn't ask any questions about why this woman was so available and why she was able to breastfeed. I think she knew intuitively that this was this child's mother. I think she knew. Why was she available so suddenly, you know, available? Coincidentally, I can imagine when she, when she saw her baby, her face lit up. She went, oh, of course I would raise him. It would be my pleasure to raise him. You knew. You can't hide that. Well, this story ends well, for when the child is about three years old, his mother takes him back to Pharaoh's daughter, and he becomes her son. It says in verse 9, and you read with me very quickly, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. I will pay you. Actually, when it talks about nursing him, so the woman took the baby and nursed him, uh, uh, and when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he, when she said that, when it says the child grew older, it means the child was weaned. That would be around three years of age, somewhere around there. So this story ends well, for when the child is about three years of age, his mother takes him back to Pharaoh's daughter, and he becomes her son. And his adopted mother names him Moses, which means literally, I drew a boy drawn out of water. The Nile River had been a a blessing. It was supposed to have been a curse to the Egyptian people, to the Hebrew people, uh, because all the boys were drowned in the Nile. But here it's a blessing to this woman. And actually, ultimately, it's going to be a blessing to the entire people of the Hebrew nation. And we're going to discover later on that his nameless mother became the parent, this boy's nameless mother became the parent of the one who would deliver the Hebrews from Egypt. Who would deliver them from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt. There's no way that she could have known that her son would become that. She didn't know. And we could end the story now. This is a great story. It's a wonderful story. It's a cute story. We could end the story right now and conclude that mother knows best for her child, so she did what was best and proved to be a heroic mother. And we could end the story right there. And we would say, this was a really cute story. But folks, this story is about her But in fact, it is also not about her. That's why her name is not mentioned here. Actually, in this story, it is actually about these, this story is really about these numerous coincidences that occurred that all pointed to a greater story being told and that this mother whose name is actually Jezebel and the sister whose name is Miriam are only small parts of a bigger story. This story is really about God. This story is about God whom Jacob spoke about just before he died to be with the God in Exodus chapter 48 and 21. And listen to what he says. Then Israel said to Joseph, his son, I am about to die. I'm about to die. But God will be with you. And he will take you back to the land of your father. He says, I will be with you. 
That's the same God who later on in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 25 said, So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. This is the same God who in Exodus 2 and 25 heard the groanings of the Israelites and remembered the covenant that he had made with them. It's interesting, even though God is not named or mentioned in this story, he is not mentioned in this story. Yet in this story, all of these so-called coincidences were actually all orchestrated by God in fulfillment of his promises beginning in Genesis chapter 12. Because in Genesis chapter 12, if you read it, you will say, see, that it was a promise that from Abraham, he will make a great nation. And he will bless them to be a blessing. That's the promise. So the interesting thing about this story is that we can discover is that God is always at work through faithful mothers using the apparent coincidences of life to accomplish his promises. Now we can look at some of our coincidences. What, 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 what are you talking about, Pastor Mike? This, this is all about God. Yes, it is about God, but actually God is not mentioned in this text. And the mother is not mentioned. And yet, and the sister's name is not mentioned. And yet, in the midst of all this, there's all these coincidences. We, we look in the text and we see, first of all, the first coincidence is that mother's, uh, Moses' mother was able to hide him for seven Seven months when other boys had been killed for seven months uh, for uh, for uh, three months uh, sh I'm sorry she she hid him right and then when you look at another coincidence Moses is not injured as he journeys down the Nile do you know what's in the Nile crocodiles <laughs> all right that tar, that little tar, uh, that little ark could have sunk. It could have overturned. It could have gotten jammed in the reeds and no one had noticed it. This Moses is not injured as he journeys down the Nile. What a coincidence. And then another coincidence is that Pharaoh's own daughter ignores his decree to kill all Hebrew baby boys and she keeps Moses. What a coincidence that she looked on the child and she thought, oh, I had compassion on a Hebrew child. Why? Why this particular child? What a coincidence. And then another coincidence is that Miriam, uh, Moses' sister, got to speak directly to Pharaoh's daughter as Moses was found. And another coincidence. Moses' own mother gets to raise him after putting him in the little ark. She gets to raise him. And, and, and coincidences of all coincidences, Moses' mother gets a regular government check to support her son. Could you imagine that? Huh? She gets a government check to support her son. And then coincidences of all coincidences, the child is raised under state protection of the oppressors of his own people. State protection. He has the best of the best, best education, the best upbringing, the best uh, uh, strategies of minds and nurture. He's going to be raised in a family of privilege. And then most of all, another telling coincidence is though females were spared, females also frustrated Pharaoh's plans. I always say you can never tell a woman what to do. <laughs> you can't. Because Pharaoh tried. And you will notice that the midwives didn't do what they were supposed to do. And his daughter didn't do what she was supposed to do. Uh, uh, and so the, the, these women who were uh, excluded from the, uh, being killed actually are the very ones who opened the door. What a coincidence. So what does all these coincidences tell us? 
This story is not just about a mother who knows best. It's about God. It's about God, the sovereign God, who is fulfilling his promises to deliver his people through the birth of Moses. This birth story is actually contrasting with the coming of another deliverer who was a better Moses in Matthew chapter 2. And in both of these stories, a male child was born. In both of these stories, a male child, his life was threatened by the ruler who was in power at that time. In both these stories, though the child was rescued, other children were killed in an effort to make sure that this child would die. In both these stories, you would discover that both Moses and Jesus had humble beginnings but glorious endings. And in both these stories, both had faithful mothers who knew best for their sons by the providence of God. I want to tell you today, dear friends, Jesus Christ is a more excellent Moses. He is God who came to earth after giving out the privileges of heaven. And he immediately and identified himself with us by taking on a human body. And you'll discover that in his death and his resurrection and his ascension to the throne of God on our behalf, it ensures that if you and I will put our faith in him, that you can experience a new life now and a new life for eternity. Now. That's the providence of God. And that this same Jesus Christ, who is a more excellent Moses, through his Holy Spirit, he works through the apparent coincidences of life, even using faithful mothers to accomplish his promises for his people. And that is something you should want to be a part of. And I dare say that right now I... Pray that the spirit of the living God, the sovereign God, who is told of in this story, is working in your heart right now to hear his voice, to hear him calling you to him. Listen, one of the things that I want to tell you is that God brought us together, you and I, this congregation and myself and my my, uh, lovely wife, brought us together by a series of seeming coincidences. But we know it was the Lord working through these actions to fulfill his promises to bless his people. It wasn't about me. It wasn't even about you. It was all about God. That's the reason why today, by these seeming coincidences, that's why you have a black British West Indian with three passports and married to a Spanish-speaking American-born Honduran as the pastor of an American-born Chinese church in New York City. (laughs) Only God. Give him the praise. Only God. Only God could have worked it out by these seeming coincidences to his praise and his glory. So today, I ask you to consider that there are no coincidences. That we serve a truly sovereign God who is charting a course for our lives, charting a course for his people. And the promises of the Old Testament, he said, that I will bless my people, I will be with you, I will guide you, I will deliver you. Those promises are true even now. And so today, as we get ready to take communion and we participate in this communion meal, I want you to know there is no coincidence that you are sitting in this room right now as we are taking communion. It's no coincidence. It's all part of the plan of the sovereign God who's calling all of us out of darkness into light through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, so that you and I can participate 
in this memorial meal that we remember that Jesus Christ is our deliverer. That this sovereign God who came to live among us as God in flesh. He made a difference in the past and he's making a difference now and he will make a difference in the future because there's no coincidences in our lives. Let's pray. Sovereign God, we come to take communion today. And we don't come to take communion lightly. For we know as we are praying now for this, for this meal, and we are praying for this message, that you will remind us that there is no coincidences in the life of God's people. Because you are a sovereign God who works through every coincidence in our lives. to fulfill your plans and your purposes. And I know today, Lord, that you work through mothers, you using the apparent coincidences of their lives to accomplish your promises and your plans. Allow that to sit in our hearts and that we could become more and more aware how you are at work, working in our lives in powerful ways that only later can we look back and say, Look what God has done. And mother may have thought she knew best, but it really was mother knew best by the providence of God because you are at work in all of these coincidences calling us back to you. And for that, Lord, we give thanks and we rejoice in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning, I want to call our ushers forward as we uh, prepare to take communion. There's something wonderful about communion. It really 